So I want to uh, welcome everyone to our third uh, end of life education uh, training presentation with the Oregon uh, Older Adult Behavioral Health Initiative. Uh, we're gonna do a couple of intro slides before we go into the presentation today. Uh, first, I would just like to have everyone mute your mic. Uh, we're gonna utilize the chat for questions and comments. And then at the end of the presentation, we will um, have time to answer those questions. Also, the slides and the recording will be available to all of you. Um, and that live attendance is required for the CEU credits. To claim the CEU credits for today's training, we are going to send out a follow-up email and that will have a survey. Um, you must complete that and return it to um, the same email address that the survey came out from. And then also, if you wanna receive a certificate of attendance, the PSU's Institute for Aging will be sending out another follow-up survey to um, just gauge what you learned today, any topics of interest, and how we are doing as specialists and as an initiative. And then just to let you know again, everything is gonna come, um, the PowerPoint presentation, the recording, and uh, any other materials that the presenters would like to include. Um, into that follow-up email. And so to do an overview of the Older Adult Behavioral Health Initiative, uh, in 2015, the Oregon Health Administrative, Administration um, created and funded the initiative, and we have 24 specialists assigned to one or more counties, and we're all contracted and co-located at community mental health organizations. And so we address the unique needs of older adults and people with disabilities with behavioral health needs. And our specialists are engaged in collaborations and coordination in the systems of care. We help build knowledge capacity through free workforce development training and community education. And we also provide complex care consultations for community-based organizations, agencies, and just uh, community members. If you have an older adult who has um, some needs that are not being met and we can help do systems navigation and referrals and um, whatnot. So there's a specialist in every county in Oregon. So reach out and these are the emails and the numbers of the Southern Oregon um, specialists. Uh, we also have one more session in our end of life series, and that is next week. Um, myself will be uh, doing advanced care planning conversations and uh, after death care directives. Then we also are doing a specific advanced care planning workshop for the LGBT community um, relating to how to maintain death sovereignty um, within uh, so this is the link to register for all of our events and you'll get this slide in the follow-up email. So without further ado, I'd like to present um, and introduce Elizabeth Johnson and Erin Collins. They're gonna be talking about community-centered end-of-life care and end-of-life doulas, and they are from the Peaceful Presence Project. And the Peaceful Presence Project is a nonprofit organization based in Bend, Oregon, uh, with a mission to reimagine the way communities talk about, plan for, and experience serious illness and the end of life. So co-directors Elizabeth Johnson and Erin Collins, uh, they're gonna discuss their mission of improving end of life literacy and empowering communities with the skills and knowledge to support each other in living, aging, and dying well in place. So I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Angela. And I'm just going to do a screen share here. Is that visually okay for everybody? Thumbs yeah, up? that's great. great. Um, 
And I apologize, I'm here working in my home office and somebody has decided to use a power tool outside. So I'm hoping there's not too much background noise, the, the benefits of working at home. Um, so thank you so much for allowing us to be here in this space with you. Um, as Angela said, I'm Elizabeth Johnson and I'm here with Aaron Collins. We co-direct uh, the organization, the Peaceful Presence Project. We're based, our base is here in Central Oregon um, and we work to serve um, Oregon in general. So we've got initiatives happening throughout the state. Um, and so we are, I'll share the objectives here. The objectives of our, of our time here um, really are to talk about, describe, um, and have you all understand what the compassionate communities model of care looks like and why it really is important and relevant um, right now for, for our communities. And then two, to, to have you all be able to identify the ways in which end-of-life doulas um, support individuals during serious and terminal illness with the hope that with this knowledge um, and awareness, um, you can serve as resources or um, make referrals for end-of-life doulas if you're um, in contact with, with individuals or families that might benefit from this kind of layer of support. So we wanted to start out just kind of talking about the compassionate communities model of care because this is something that really informs um, kind of the work and the foundation of our um, organization in, in the world. So, um, the Compassionate Communities Model of Care has really been greatly influenced by um, someone named Dr. Alan Kelleher. And the idea of Compassionate Communities um, initially emerged uh, really in the 1980s from the World Health Organization um, promotion of something known as healthy communities or healthy cities. And this notion that, you know, whereas formalized health services um, or other services are really useful in a lot of situations, that more um, holistic interventions that include involvement from local governments, um, educational systems, faith communities, um, neighborhood associations, neighbors in general, is really needed to bring about more key change and quality support for people. So in the 1990s and 2000s, this approach really started being applied to palliative care um, and critical public health. So the Compassionate Communities movement is notable because it really um, promotes a, a social model of palliative care. And it focuses on um, community development as it's connected to end of life planning, um, bereavement support, and really, you know, hopefully a more improved approach when it comes to how people die and how they are cared for. Um, and because, you know, caregiving and dying and death and grieving really is a universal experience, palliative care is, is really, you know, increasingly seen to be a, a public health issue for all of us. So when all of this comes together, um, compassionate communities, as we have here on the screen, really widen the circle of caring and, and provide much, hopefully much needed support to patients and caregivers um, <clears throat> when, when someone is facing serious illness or death. And so this model aims to really, one, um, help normalize conversations around death and dying, um, as well as bereavement, so that care can become hopefully um, more quality and really productive in nature. Um, it works to, to reposition palliative care um, so that it's really capable of supporting more community-based health um, and social care for people at, at the end of life, including their families. And then it strives to help, you know, develop strong networks of care so that essentially, you know, communities are more prepared and resilient when it comes to navigating um, terminal illness, grief, death, et cetera. So this model really recognizes that the community is, is capable and, and positioned to step in I mean, a more active and meaningful and supportive role when people are navigating um, illness or, or an end of life experience. Because as we have here on the screen, you know, we know that when it comes to illness and death and loss, there is a universality to this and they all have the potential to touch any of us at any point during the course of our lives. It's difficult to anticipate when this might actually happen, but they do touch all this. this we, we are all touched by these experiences. 
um, you know, in our own country here in the U.S., we're and across the globe, we're really experiencing a, a ballooning of of individuals. You know, our, our baby boomer population who are living um, longer in in declining health and presenting with more complex needs, and so with this comes a lot of challenges. Um, and at its core, the compassion idea of compassion within this model means cultivating really um, an ability to um, turn, turn towards the, the complex needs, the suffering that we're witnessing in our communities and recognizing that in a lot of ways, we're not separate from the suffering, from the complexity of, of these needs. And then through this accepting, you know, this means that we all can develop more practical skills and wisdom. So we're able to show up for one another, um, and, and know what resources exist and, and what support is required when somebody is in need. So Dr. Kelleher um, is constantly bringing us back to this perspective that death really is a social event with a medical component versus a medical comp medical event that just happens to have a social component. And you know we often talk about that this, this distinction is really important because it, it, it informs where and how we can all feel empowered to be involved that within the social sphere of life and death, we do have an empowered right to, to show up and to support one another and to be more resourced around this. Um, and Dr. Kelhar often says that, that health and well-being are really everyone's business. So it's this recognition that, that care for one another um, during times of you know, a medical complexity, during loss, is not just the, the sole, solely the role of health and social services, but that really it's this person-centered approach um, and, and that there's a per person-centered community that's really there to kind of step in and, and support when, when, there's, when there's end of life or kind of illness needs. So we have on here on the screen, the 95% rule and, and research has shown that typically when somebody is facing a terminal illness or dealing with an end of life experience, usually only five to 6% of their time is spent face-to-face -face with a medical professional. And this is oftentimes a really striking statistic for people to hear. Um, so, you know, if we really are, are paying attention to this, you know, and questions around quality of life and end of life care, the questions that we're encouraging, you know, all of us to ask are what are we as communities really doing with this other 95% of the time? What is happening for people in that space? And what sort of support are, are people receiving? Um, and, and is it sufficient? And when we look at end of life care as, as including um, psych psychological, social, spiritual, um, and physical support, how, how do we step in and make care um, be less reliant upon these sort of kind of episodic service visits, right? What, what else can we do within those, within those spaces for one another? And we know that, that people really are not receiving sufficient support. Research has shown that the community members who are living with life-limiting illnesses commonly encounter things like depression, anxiety, uh, a lot of social stigma, um, disenfranchisement, you know, the sense of nobody knows what to do with this experience. And those that used to be around me have sort of disappeared to the corners of my life. Um, there's a lot of family issues and dynamics that can play out. Financial picture, financial strain for people can really change. Suicide oftentimes increases during these windows. So these are really um, key determinants of, of quality of life for the dying and their caregivers. And, and a lot of these um, social and psychological and spiritual problems cannot always be easily addressed, right? Just by health services, especially in these last days of life. Um, and we oftentimes you know, talk about the comorbidities that, that accompany um, people when they're navigating uh, life-limiting illnesses. And, and these really are um, the things that are, are a challenge for a lot of people, the things we have listed here on the screen, the, the stigma, the social isolation, the fear, the loneliness. Um, the, the good news is that these comorbidities are a lot of times responsive to 
um, harm reduction to prevention and to what we kind of refer to as community supported interventions that are oftentimes used in other um, public health campaigns. And that especially engaging the community in, in end of life caring is a really key component to this, which is what the compassionate communities model is um, I'm trying to sort of um, have emerge in a lot of communities across the across the US. And we know that oftentimes people don't need more medicine or counseling or doctor's visits, but they just need more uh, consistent sort of wraparound support. So Dr. Kelleher defines a, a compassionate community as one that recognizes all natural cycles of sickness and death, or excuse me, sickness and health, birth and death, love and loss. And these occur with every day within the orbits of its institutions and regular activities. Um, so it really values uh, more of a whole systems approach, which ideally includes loved ones, neighbors, health services, local governments, um, schools, and, and social and cultural sectors. So as you can see from the image here on the screen, what you're hoping, to, what we're hoping to do here is create this ecosystem of care that sort of emerges, emerges around a person. You can see here that the dying person is really at the center. And then there's this collaborative um, network of sort of diverse stakeholders. So there's a more holistic and, and cohesive web when it, and in place when it comes to supporting those at end of life. Um, so you see the dying person surrounded by kind of the more immediate people who are there to able either support or who are impacted by, by this experience, surrounded by, on this image, we have the end of life um, doula network, which Aaron will talk more about here in a moment surrounded by a healthcare system, surrounded by government policy and public health. And that all these different entities are sort of working to really surround and, and support. Um, so compassionate communities really you know, are communities that ideally are developing these social networks and these social spheres and these policies that help to support people through you know the hours and days and weeks and months and sometimes years of living with a life limiting illness and included in this are experiences of of grief and and bereavement and and caregiving for individuals so i just want to talk a bit about um death literacy before i hand it off to to, to aaron next so understanding you know the the 95 rule we see the death literacy is 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 really essential to all of this and death literacy is typically defined as a set of knowledge and skills that really make it possible um, to gain access, to gain access to and understand um, end of life death care options. So knowing what services are available and affordable and how to pull these services in. So it's really um, about kind of developing this practical wisdom, which is the good news, is something that we all we all can develop and something that our work is really focused on. Um, being death literate really meet, strengthens our ability to care, meaning that we are inher inherently sort of creating these compassionate communities. And then it's focused on uh, the cultivation of, of skills and knowledge and sort of the social action that in turn helps to create more systemic change for people who are ill or dying. Um, and we know through research that the communities that are really rich um, and diverse in terms of relationships really are key to this. And there's so many communities where this already is a part of, you know, sort of the daily interactions that somebody has. So this, this model is less about implementing more of a kind of standardized program and more about helping communities to sort of recognize this mutual care philosophy, and then having this be translated into more um, concrete, um, more localized practices that are that's really being community led, right? What this might look like here could look like a slightly different um, version of this in, in a different community. So it really looks at um, building capacity through education and sort of shared experiences within a community. Um, it's all about community strengths and looking at the assets that that exist within within already kind of um, circulating networks, 
and then knowing that the community is really seen as the experts of the of the own of their own living and dying process and so um, all of these different um, sort of stakeholders are are valued as as key um, members of all of this. And there's some really great um, online information if anyone's interested about helping cities develop a compassionate communities charter. Um, there's um, death literacy indexes that people can sort of apply and use locally to see where your community stacks up in terms of 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 both you know kind of practical and then more psychosocial death literacy. And then finally, we have some, you know, statistics here on the screen that just highlight some of these um, deficits. I think a lot of times the communities experience that really only one in five um, people know how to navigate the health system when someone is dying. Only one in three know how to navigate the funeral industry. What does that even look like in terms of setting stuff up ahead of a death or afterwards? Only half of us know where to get information on about palliative care or even understand what palliative care looks like in the first place. And only 22% of people know how to access palliative care in, in local communities. So these are pretty significant statistics. And we know that, that communities with high levels of death literacy have um, content specific knowledge about death and dying. And so there's a bill, this ability to put that knowledge into um, practice, again, as, as a form of social action, sort of the idea of social capital that's built up around this. Um, and it ideally is, you know, putting the, a sense of power or empowerment back into people's hands. And so once this happens, death literacy becomes a, a very real resource that people can use um, for the benefit of themselves and their loved ones. So I will pause there and I'm gonna hand it over to Erin and she's gonna get a little bit more into um, the work of end of life doulas and then use our um, organization um, as sort of an example of how that looks here. Thanks Elizabeth. And, um, hello and well, um, hello to all of you and thanks for having us. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned earlier, that you saw that kind of ecosystem of care and that the commun the compassionate communities model really is about um, an interconnected web or an interconnected system of care. So we're not saying that we don't need health care or health systems, but it is about looking at what is outside of the walls of the health systems. What is available to us in a public health approach to palliative care? I happen to be um, a certified hospice and palliative care nurse. I worked for 15 years in the health system and specifically in end of life care. And when I came to this um, work and co-created, co co-founded this organization with Elizabeth, it was because I had seen how many people were arriving to my care, to our care in hospice, afraid of death, afraid of talking about death, um, and really unprepared for the end of their life, really in this kind of um, death denial. And so I looked outside of nursing, outside of bedside nursing to look at community health nursing. How could I look at the population and say, how can we do um, some interventions community-wide, public health-wide, to start to ease this suffering, to alleviate some of that anxiety and fear and, un and being unprepared. So I found out about end of life doulas. And many of you may already un um, know about doulas, but if you don't, um, the doula really um, came, it's an ancient Greek word doula is, and it's just, it was in that language and in that time frame. it was a woman serving another woman. It was adopted and really brought into the United States um, culturally as birth doulas in the, in the 70s and 80s, right? Um, people who were trained to show up in a non-medical capacity for the birthing process to provide and try to alleviate that um, kind of uh, movement towards medicalized birth. Well, the same thing has happened um, at the end of life. Because uh, our end of life care has really become more medicalized and, and hospice is a Medicare benefit. And so it's really been taken more into the health system. 
the idea of the end of life doula is to to bring it back into the community and to provide that wraparound support that Elizabeth mentioned that is so key to improving end of life experiences and to improving death literacy. So end of life doulas are non-medical companions for dying people and their families. And doulas work as a complement and or in collaboration or partnership with hospice and palliative care. Um, not, we don't usurp the roles at all. Again, we're not going outside of the health system. We're working alongside it and filling in those gaps in care um, that exist in our culture and in our society today. And Elizabeth talked about the comorbidities of serious and terminal illness. And this is where end of life doulas really can provide excellent support is in um, alleviating or doing that harm reduction and prevention with those comorbid comorbidities. Um, end of life doulas provide physical support, right? Um, sometimes respite caregiving, um, non-medical symptom management emotional um, support by with active listening and um, and just uh, processing spiritual support um, as an extension if somebody is enrolled in hospice or palliative care or has a strong faith community they might have spiritual support but there are a lot of folks who don't have that spiritual support but do have spiritual aspects of who they are and doulas support that and then again, practical support. So just the logistics that need to, that come up around supporting someone at the end of life, um, you know, within the home, within the community, um, within the caregiving needs. Those are all some practical, um, uh, practical ways that doulas support as well. Elizabeth, next um, slide, please. So this doula model of care, again, it's a non-medical role. And, the outer circle here are all the different ways that um, end of life doulas may be as uh, roles that they may take on in this caring circle for someone who has serious or terminal illness. Um, and I'll show you in a minute kind of a timeline for support that really shows that somebody doesn't have to be at the end of life to benefit from the services or the support of an end of life doula. As I mentioned, there's practical support, there's emotional support, there's logistical support and spiritual. Um, and you also see on here hospice volunteers. And oftentimes someone might be a hospice volunteer and chooses to train um, and get additional skills and knowledge in the end of life doula model. Or it can sometimes go the other way around where someone is trained as an end of life doula and then steps into the role of hospice volunteer to either gain experience or just bring that um, additional level of skill set into the hospice volunteer role. Next slide. So we always like to say that the, the moniker of end of life doula really is a misnomer because there's so much that we do um, upstream, upstream of hospice and palliative care that we support people when they are healthy through advanced care planning and conversation. Um, and when someone is diagnosed with an illness, there's a lot of that practical support that might come in or advocacy for someone. If and when an illness becomes terminal, um, that's when our services really can be incredibly beneficial, doing additional planning, getting the family ready, um, preparing to have that person in their home. What does that look like? What is needed? And then through the active dying and hospice phases, we provide a lot of education to families and support to families in that whether it's in that respite caregiving or more around the clock support, really being supportive when hospice can't be in the home, which um, I think is a common myth about hospice is that once someone is enrolled, they have 24 hour care and hospice is there. And to a certain extent that is true. There is 24 hour um, availability of hospice by the phone. But for the most part, hospice is not in your home 24 hours. It goes back to that 95% rule that really um, 
the hospice and or palliative care team is going to have intermittent visits throughout the week. So what happens in all that time when um, they aren't there? And really the, the hospice um, visitors are kind of managing the care and coordinating the care. They aren't necessarily providing direct hands-on care that, um, that supports that dying person or their family. And then finally in this timeline is the after death. Um, that we, as end of life doulas, we can provide that continuity of care from a healthy person just initiating conversations all the way to maintain that thread through the after death phase when there are bereavement needs, when there are funeral needs, when there are um, different logistical needs that come after death. So this is um, just showing that end of life doulas really do fill that gap in care in the compassionate communities model. We really help fill in that 95% of the time. Next slide, Elizabeth. So Angela gave us a wonderful introduction and let you know our mission, to reimagine the way that communities talk about, plan for, and experience the last stage of life. Um, we were founded in 2018, became a nonprofit in 2019, with the intention, it has always been our intention, that anybody who desires or needs this level of support, needs wraparound collaborative support, could benefit from our services regardless of their ability to pay. We work as a collective of doulas in a team approach so that it's not just one-on-one. -on -one. You don't just hire one doula and that's your person because the reality is there is such a big gap in that 95% of the time that we have to work as a team. And each of our doulas has different strengths and different um, you know, uh, more expanded skill sets in certain areas. And so when we work as a team, we really do provide a rich and um, empowering experience for families. Elizabeth, next slide. So our mission, you saw, but our vision is a world, or at least, um, a, at least an Oregon at this point, where every person, every family, every community member knows what to do when someone is ill or dying or grieving. And it might not be that they um, have the particular skill set to do what is needed, but they know how to access the folks that can support them in that way. So we hope and, and envision that, that the health systems know that this level of support is available that civic leaders know that this level of support is available, that our neighbors and our family members and our friends all understand that there is this interconnected ecosystem of care to surround people at the end of life. And it makes it maybe a little less scary. It makes it a little more doable um, to, to care for our own ill and dying neighbors and family members. Next slide. So we have kind of three, um, just to give you um, our organization as sort of a case study, and then we'll talk about two specific cases, um, client cases to really illustrate how does this play out. We see the Peaceful Presence Project as, like I said, a case study of how can, um, how can you incorporate or embed this compassionate communities model within your own community. For us, we are, um, an organization who does a lot of education. So we do community-based education just like we're doing today. We offer um, workshops on different options for end of life or options for care. We do a lot of planning for the end of life, whether that's advanced care planning um, and, and also teaching advanced care planning for clinicians, teaching that communication for clinicians how to better communicate with their patients and how to better have these difficult conversations. But also one-on-one -on -one and in group settings, we do advanced care planning um, so that folks start to have an understanding of how to have these conversations with their family and their friends, how to consider naming someone as a um, surrogate decision maker, and how to actually get a plan in place and on paper and into the health system where it can actually be accessed. And then finally is that presence, that can collaborative support that we provide for folks who are seriously or terminally ill. 
respite caregiving, around the clock support, um, and, and other work um, uh, to support those comorbidities of serious and terminal illness. So these are our main program areas. And just to point out that we really and truly are founded on the belief that equitable and compassionate end of life care is a human right. As Elizabeth said about death literacy, that the, this knowledge and skill set is about social action. And we believe that that is true. And that's why we are a nonprofit organization. Next slide. So um, two, we're gonna present two case studies. I'll present this first one and then hand it over to Elizabeth, but two really um, fairly different. Both of these women, as you can see, um, are young. And that's not always the case with our clients, but it is a good reminder, um, as Elizabeth said in one of her first slides, that illness and um, both serious and terminal illness can and will touch all of us at some point in our life. And both of these women were young. Um, this first one uh, is a woman who had four different lung diseases, hereditary lung diseases. She'd never smoked a cigarette a day of her life, but she was dependent on oxygen. She um, was not on hospice when we met. She lived uh, in a very rural part of central Oregon, 45 minutes from the nearest town. She uh, had a really wonderful friend who was visiting weekly. Um, this person, this um, woman, we started seeing her in 2020 and late 2020. And as many of you may remember, we had significant wildfires at that time. We were in the very earliest months of the COVID pandemic. This woman um, was married to a man who worked 60 hours outside the home in construction. So she was home uh, in her, she was alone in her rural home for most of her time, most of the day. Uh, couldn't leave her home because of the fires and um, because of COVID. Her dear friend came once a week, let the dogs out and kind of visited, but quite soon realized that she just didn't have the capacity and didn't have the skills and the knowledge to support her friend. Her friend did not want to talk about hospice. Although she had these four diseases, um, when we met, she said, oh, that's great. I just, I, but just so you know, I'm not going to hospice. I'm not, I'm not going to go there. Um, and, you know, when we kind of talked about it a little bit more, well, no, I don't want to go back to the ICU, though. She didn't want to go to the hospital, didn't want to die in the ICU, but also really was not interested in talking about hospice. So we started visiting um, a couple of times a week. And in those first few weeks, each of us just provided gentle reminders. Each time she brought something up as a barrier to her care or a barrier to her having a quality of life, we would gently remind her, oh, you know, this is something that hospice provides. I know you're not ready. But when you are, just so you know that hospice will be there and will be ready for you and will provide this service. One of her biggest barriers was getting medications. Um, as you can imagine, she had a number of medications and couldn't leave the house to get them. So when she was running low and her husband was working, right, all day long, didn't have any opportunity to go to the pharmacy. And so it was always a challenge to get what she needed. Um, but we would remind her, hospice will deliver these medications when you're ready. Um, she also, there was really no coordination in her care at the time. As I mentioned, she did not have any sort of advanced directive, even though she did not want to go to the ICU. Um, she also had an estranged, she had two sons, one who she was quite close with and one who she was quite estranged from. And that was something that came up each week when we just listened and let her talk through that. Finally, after four weeks of visiting with her multiple times a week, she said, you know what, um, she was, she'd have another lung infection. She was feeling really crummy. And she said, you know, um, I think I'm ready. You have made hospice sound less scary. I'm not afraid of it. And so I'm ready to go to hospice. So we were able to facilitate um, an admission visit for hospice. 
Um, she was getting really sick. And so once we got her admitted to hospice within 24 hours, they admitted her to an inpatient unit. We have a hospice house here in Central Oregon. She um, got into hospice house and died seven days later. So what this illustrates is that end of life doulas, again, is that misnomer that we really work upstream and really encourage hospice and palliative care. All the things that we did probably could have been done with hospice support, but when someone has a seven day hospice stay, there's not time for that relationship building. There's not time for the trust. There's not time to work through all of these different issues. Um, as a matter of fact, while she was in the inpatient unit, I um, had the absolute privilege to be visiting with her one day when the son who she was estranged from called. And she, I said, oh, oh, let me step out. And she said, no, 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 stay here, stay here. She wanted to hold my hand throughout that conversation. And at the end of the conversation, she said, you know, she was tearful and she was joyful that she had had this reconciliation over the phone. And she said, wow, you just witnessed a miracle. And I said, yeah, isn't it amazing that he called? And she said, no, you, you witnessed the miracle that my doula was here for that call that that's the miracle is that the timing of this and that was because of the relationship we had developed over several weeks and um you know ultimately we would love to be encouraging um, our clients to get on hospice months ahead so that they can also have that hospice support and hospice relationship but it doesn't always happen but we did provide that surrounding support and it worked in collaboration so I'll pass it back to Elizabeth to finish up with this last um, case study. Thanks, Erin. So the second case study, also a, a, a female um, who had a 50 year old who was dealing with metastatic endometrial cancer, um, had been going through treatments for about a year and a half or so. This person had a um, 15 turned 16 year old daughter when we were working with, her, with them. Um, and, and really was in that mindset of, I'm going to fight this at all costs. So um, when she received um, the news that she had, you know, about four to six weeks of life left, it caught everybody off guard, um, including her aging um, parents who were visiting here in Central Oregon, um, staying in Central Oregon in order to, to support her. And so it was actually her cancer support group that reached out to um, our organization and said, this, this family needs support, can, can you get involved? And so what we found is that she had an extremely um, caring and very present community of, of very dear friends. Um, to the extent where there was almost, it was a phenomenon of too many cooks in the kitchen and not really knowing who was directing what, who was doing what. It was also during a, a time where we were having a pretty significant COVID spike here in Central Oregon. Um, and her, her parents were saying, you know, we don't know how to be gatekeepers for the house. People, some people are coming in masks. Some people are not coming in masks. Some people are really understanding the kind of um, the acuteness of what's happening here. And other people are stopping by and saying, yeah, let's, let's, I'm going to take you out for, for a, um, a walk or a drive, which was not really appropriate where she was in terms of, of her illness. And so we, um, we, we became involved and, you know, one of the first things we did was to say, okay, what sort of planning have you done? What sorts of people do you want around? Who do you not want around? How do you want the space to feel? How do you want your, your parents to be caregiving? And who else might be able to step in and support? What are the um, kind of skills or tools or assets that already exist within your community? And who are the appropriate people to really be there and, and care? Um, what does it look like to not have this be an open house where people are coming at all hours of the day, but what sort of framework or infrastructure do we need to be able to put into place um, to really meet your needs? And not just the needs of our dying client, but also her exhausted family who was, who was trying to be there and really was on point 24 seven. And so um, we, we worked both kind of in a front and center way, really acting as advocates and helping to do some of that gatekeeping with some of the community 
um, managing some of those or tending to some of those relationships, especially when it came to sort of risk management decisions, COVID, um, and then a lot of kind of the back of back of the house or background support, setting up online systems where people could sign up for support shifts. We had some of our trained doulas along with Aaron and I stepping in and taking some of the night nighttime hours where the parents really needed to get some rest, but ended up being you know awake and and with her for you know windows of like 1 a.m. to to 5 a.m. So really looking at what are the greatest needs here and how do we sort of empower and involve her really, you know, wanting to support community in a way that makes sense for everyone. Um, another really clear wish of hers, she was a practicing Buddhist, was that she wanted to die at home and she wanted to um, potentially be at home for multiple days, for two days after the death. And we sat down um, to, you know, talk through a lot of these desires and her her closest friends and her family all said, you know, we know, we know this is actually not something that's possible, but it is a desire. And it was a really beautiful sort of pause in, in the conversation for Aaron and I both to be able to say that actually is possible. And, um, you know, we, we could help empower you as her community to make that a reality. And so the pictures we have here on the screen um, are her, her beloved, some of her dearest friends, her stepmother, um, and then Aaron and I, in, in a volunteer capacity, um, end of life doulas do not do any after death care hands on work. That's not something that falls within the funeral director role. So, in a, in a volunteer capacity, we were able to be there um, and sort of in, you know, again, in the wings, direct her, her closest um, women to help wash her body, to put um, salve on her body, to adorn her in these beautiful. Um, um, Tibetan cloths that were so meaningful to her. A friend was able to go get flowers and, and she really ended up looking like a queen in her room. And through that process, we had her there for two days um, where family, family members, community members, friends, people from outside of town could come through and, and get those final um, moments with her, even though she was, she was gone, um, they were able to, to you know, honor and, and acknowledge the passing. And it was a really important, I think, process for her daughter as well. There was a sense of, of, of trepidation or fear around the dying process and having her mother be there at home after death and being given that time to really be near her and to see her, um, you know, in that physical form where she did really just look so well cared for and beautiful um, and, and in a space that, you know, it was at home in the bedroom, a place that the daughter really recognized and felt good and I think really had an impact on, on her own grieving process um, and her ability to kind of be, be with the loss than the death of her mother. So hopefully those are two helpful um, examples of, of ways in which um, we in that in end of life doula role were able to kind of step in and, and support. And then we just wanted to share a final slide here, um, just to kind of give an example of how we are as an organization um, uh, striving to marry this, this compassionate communities model with the role that we play as end of life doulas. So we're currently working to um, develop and establish funding um, for something we're calling our No One Dies Alone Central Oregon programming. Typically the No One Dies Alone um, framework or approach is oftentimes um, kind of uh, driven by more clinical settings. So maybe a hospital or a hospice will have a No One Dies Alone um, program. We're envisioning um, a more community centered approach um, really based on the understanding that every person deserves to have planning, support, and care to die where and how they want. Erin mentioned the advanced care planning work that we do, and we were funded um, by an organization here in, in Central Oregon to do advanced care planning outreach to unhoused and vulnerably housed community members. And we're in the midst of that um, initiative right now, and we receive more funding to actually make it be a sustained service here in the community. And so through that work and building up partnerships with a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of different medical and service providers, we are imagining and to form this program that essentially is creating a coalition um, of, of both medical and service providers, faith community leaders, other nonprofits um, to really help identify who are the greatest 
um, who are the community members who, are, who have the greatest need and might be most unsupported when it comes to end of life experiences, including those who are unhoused. Um, oftentimes there's so many barriers to care when somebody isn't housed and doesn't have a permanent physical address. Um, so who are those people? And then establishing um, physical spaces, you know, a variety of physical spaces where we actually could offer up dignity conserving care for individuals who otherwise would be, you know, pretty much um, left to their own um, experience without, without this dignity conserving care, without companionship, without um, assistance in imagining what their dying, what they want their dying process to look like. So a lot more to say around that I'm aware of the time, but just hopefully it Ill, helps to illustrate um, one of the ways in which we're, you know, bringing this into our own community. So here is our contact information. I think that Angela will also probably um, share out both these slides as well as, as um, how you can reach us. And we definitely welcome conversation um, and then follow up with anyone who's interested in, in more information. So I will go off um, screen share and open it back up to Angela or Linda to see if there's any questions we can respond to. Someone did ask about local resources and I actually referred them back to you, Angela, because I know that you are kind of um, consolidating a list of local hospice and then you know, hopefully the peaceful compassionate presence project. Um, but I actually, you know, at, at one point, Aaron or Liz, you were talking about the resistance to people calling in hospice. I, you know, it seems so much that it's like this denial of I'm not going to die, um, you know, and you hear hospice and it just seems like a death sentence. So it's scary. You know, it would be great to encourage people four to six months beforehand to get that support. But I, I think there's just so much denial around it. Is that what? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think um, that's, you know, I think that that all really came to play, in my opinion, <laughs> um, this really is a result of hospice becoming a Medicare benefit with a six month um, prognosis requirement. And so everybody says, oh my God, that means six months, right? Like, oh my gosh, I'm dying. You know, I, I'm not, or I don't, I'm not dying. That's not for me. Um, there is a movement to remove that six month requirement that would enable people to have the benefits of hospice for a longer period of time. But it really is true that it is about that kind of the stigma or the myth around hospice that you have to be actively dying to receive that level of care. And so I think we have a lot of education to do and a lot of awareness still you know, it's, this is the 40 year anniversary of the hospice, Medicare hospice benefit. And there's still just a lot of awareness to, but you're, you're right that there is a lot of death denial as that comes into that as well. Linda, there's a great question in the chat box about locating a doula, if you want me to speak to that. Please. Um, so I see Jamie asked, how does one find an end-of-life doula in various parts of the country or questions that you might ask before hiring them, which is really, really great approach and, and great question. Um, so there is an organization called the National End-of-Life Doula Alliance, and I'm currently currently a board member with them. And I will, there we go, I put that link, yeah, link to that to that website. So the, the, there is a doula directory um, that's located on the National End of Life doula site. Um, and you can get in there and see information state to state who's located where. I will say that um, we're in the process of updating the website and it does feel a little, um, it's not overly user friendly. Some of the questions and the things that will, uh, we're updating it right now. And some of the things that will be added that would be, you know, kind of what might you ask is how long has somebody been in practice? Where have they received their training? How many clients have they worked with to date? Um, for us, you know, if somebody reaches out and says, I'm interested in support, 
we, we have the option to say, you know, would you like to talk to um, the family of a previous client just to learn what, what that experience was like? So, you know, do you have somebody that you've worked with? Um, you know, there, there's the confidentiality part of it, but there are a lot of families that say, oh my gosh, this was so beneficial. We would be happy to talk about what this was like and why it was a benefit to us. Um, a lot of doulas too, there's people specialize in different areas. You know, some doulas will do advanced care planning. Other doulas say, I don't do advanced care planning. I focus more on um, vigil work or helping with legacy projects. So you want to um, get clear on what's, you know, what is the need that you're kind of assessing as a family and then get, and then follow up with the doula um, and, and really kind of, you know, hone in on where are they, where are they most skilled? There's a lot of different end of life trainings that people can do to help, you know, kind of have a deeper skill set around um, psychosocial support, advanced care planning, creativity around, you know, uh, vigil stuff. So just get clear on what is their experience and, and where have they, where have they received that training? Erin, um, anything else? Or Angela, I know you as well of a deal experience. What, anything else you two would add to that? I would just say uh, just having conversations with them and really, you know, seeing if they are a good fit, um, asking different questions. Um, and, you know, there's end of life doulas now. Um, there's become more and more um, people are becoming end of life doulas. So really finding doulas within your community like your, um, your culture is more likely nowadays. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And that's the benefit of having more and more doulas get trained is that there are more, um, there's more diversity in who is out there. And I would agree that it's just about finding that perfect fit because you will spend some really, you could potentially spend some really intimate time with this person. Um, you know, much like a birth doula who's there through that birthing process, your doula could be there through the dying process. And so making sure that you really get along and that you appreciate each other is important. And just one other thing I would add to that, you know, with the benefit or that one of the interesting things of the pandemic is we've all learned how to be online in a different way. And there are doulas, if you don't have a doula in your community, you know, for example, there is somebody who reached out to us um, in Portland, which is about, you know, three plus hours away, who's dealing with ALS right now and said, I, I just want to do some end of life planning. I want support around this process. Would you all be able to work with me? Um, and that's a possibility, right? We, we've, we can build up a relationship. Um, it's different than being right in the community, but there are things that doulas can support with that may happen, um, uh, you know, if they're not exactly, you know, next door neighbors or in your community. So you can get creative about how you pull the support in as well, especially with some of that upstream work. Well, we only have a few minutes left. Is there anyone else that has a question? So, um, well, I want to thank the two of you so much for presenting. Um, really amazing presentation and the case studies. I feel like you really, you know, got it across on the possibilities. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, we will be sending out the follow-up email um, with ways of getting a hold of a peaceful presence. And um, you can check out all of the things that they offer um, on their website. And yeah. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Yes.